Ezekiel 34, 26. The Lord is saying, and I will make them, and the places round about my hill, a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. I want to preach about that today. Showers of blessing. God bless you. Please be seated. When I was in elementary school, we recited part of a poem that said, April showers bring May flowers. I was raised in South Florida. I really, really didn't know if that was true there, but it sounded good and it rhymed. So we were all taught to say that in school. But there is a science behind it. And the simplified version is this, that in the northern hemisphere, April showers result from the position of the jet stream. In early spring, the jet stream starts to move northward, allowing large depressions to bring strong winds and rain inland from the Atlantic Ocean. And April showers and warmer weather bring the new life of spring to our world. These seasonal showers are part of the genius of our creative God. Amen? Wonderful in working excellent in power and beyond our comprehension. He is a mighty God. In the Bible, rain played a significant part of their entire life as it really does for us today. In the land of Israel, there were two seasons of the year when rain fell abundantly. James wrote about this when he was talking about our need to be patient under the coming of the Lord. He said, we need to be like farmers who patiently wait to receive the early and the latter rain. He said, you can't make it rain. You just have to wait on that rain. Everything depended on these two seasons of rain. The early rain came at the seed time after the crops were planted and allowed those seeds in their germination process to sprout. The latter rain fell toward the ripening season and the maturing of the harvest. So all those kernels of wheat or rye or barley, whatever they were growing, would reach their full potential and they would have a great harvest. The first season of rain fell in Judea about the beginning of November after the seed was sown. The second season of rain fell toward the end of April when the ears were filling, as I mentioned, and it prepared for a full harvest. Without these two seasons of rain, the earth would have been unfruitful and everyone would have starved to death. Those rains were part of the agricultural cycle of the Middle East and they remain that way today, unlike the four seasons that we see in North America. When this rain cycle was disrupted, there was no harvest and no harvest brought famine to the people. We learn in the Bible that when God's people were rebellious and disobedient to his commands, there are times when God said, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to chasten you with a drought. That was God's chosen form of punishment on many occasions. Another way you could say that is when Israel turned their backs on God and toward sin, he chastened them with drought and the resulting famine. He warned of this through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 11. When you get into this new land, he said, beware that you don't forget God with the blessings that I bring in your life. Don't turn away from me and serve other gods. He said, if you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain and the ground will fail to produce its harvest. You will quickly die and that good land that the Lord is giving you. He wrote about that again in Deuteronomy 28, Jeremiah 14, Amos 4, Haggai 1, Zechariah 14, and other places in the Bible. In other words, it's not just a random occurrence in the scriptures. In essence, the Lord said, if you turn away from me towards sin, there will be drought that brings dearth and death to the land. But if you turn around toward me and repent of your sins, I will reward your righteousness with rain 
that brings life. Amen. And the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. I love this verse because it describes what it is like to live against God's principles, that that's a hard way to live. If you think about people walking away from God and the Lord withholding blessings so that they feel the pain of their sin, the consequences of their disobedience, that's what God did then. And in other ways, he does it now. And whether it's BC 2024 or 2024 AD, if there's no rain in our country, we are in serious trouble. We can say that we're in the information age, but we're still in the agricultural age because without food, I think we die. So drought was often God's method of bringing them to their knees and repentance and turning toward God. Rain, on the other hand, was symbolic of the favor of God, the blessings that came from obedience to God's word. In Deuteronomy 28, a chapter of blessings and cursings, the Lord said, if you'll obey me, then the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain to thy land in his season and to bless all the work of your hand and you'll lend to many nations and you will not borrow. In Joel's prophecy in Joel chapter two, when the Lord was speaking of the restoration of his spirit and beyond uh, Acts chapter two, he said, be glad you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord for he has given you the former rain moderately, that fall rain to them. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month of their calendar year. And your floors will be full of wheat and the vats will overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years. And he begins to name kinds of insects, locust, canker worm, palmer worm, caterpillar, that great army. In other words, God said, I brought pestilence. I brought drought. But if you will turn to me, I will open heaven. I will give you rain. At the dedication of the temple, the Lord spoke to Solomon and said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now there's much more in the Bible about drought and rain, but I think you get the picture today that drought was a result of rebellion and backsliding. And rain was a result of repentance and revival. And there to me is one really vivid story in the Bible that probably demonstrates this as clear as any other story. It occurs in the days of Elijah the prophet when King Ahab was the wicked ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel. The Bible said that he ruled over Samaria, that northern kingdom, for 22 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord above all the kings that were before him. And to make matters worse, Ahab had a really bad uh, judgment when it came to women. And he decided to marry a woman named Jezebel, who was a Zidonian. And with her, they went and served Baal and worshiped him. Now, Jezebel was a very strong-willed woman. She was an evil woman who insisted on always getting what she wanted. And it didn't matter who stood in the way or what it took. She would murder to get what she wanted. Now, she's from Sidon, a leading Phoenician city. And she brought with her marriage a strong allegiance to Baal and Ashtaroth, these false gods. Now, because of the great sins of Ahab, Jezebel, and Israel, the Lord shut up heaven so that there was no rain. You can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah goes to Ahab and he looks at him and says, 
as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years according to my word. Now, he, you know, is looking at Ahab. Ahab wants to say something. He's incensed that Elijah would say this, but Elijah just walks out and disappears. But this brings a special problem to Ahab and Jezebel because they were Baal worshipers. They were not Jehovah worshipers. And Baal was a Canaanite Phoenician god of fertility, weather, and rainstorms. You can study this for yourself, but they worship the God who made it rain. And Elijah says, there will be no rain and there will be no dew until I say so. And there was no rain. The rain god, Baal, went out of business for three years. And uh, it probably caused a credibility gap to the Baal worshipers, Ahab, Jezebel, Jezebel, and the people who followed them. And so Elijah kind of throws down the gauntlet and said, it's not raining till I say so, and we'll see he's really God. No dew, no rain, and the king is protesting, and Elijah can't be found anywhere. And through this three-year drought, there are some amazing stories of God's provision of godly people during that drought. But through this three-year season of drought, God brought Israel to their knees. And then one day the Lord told Elijah, I'm ready to bring rain. And he spoke to him and Elijah in the third year, the Lord said, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Now Ahab wanted to kill Elijah but God kept him from doing it. The Bible said that the famine was terrible in Samaria, that capital of the northern kingdom. Elijah is now calling all the people and summons them to a showdown on Mount Carmel. And he says to them, how long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the Bible said that nobody said a word. The people were silent. If we say Jehovah's God, King Ahab, Jezebel, they're probably going to kill us. But we know Elijah's a man of God and we're kind of scared of what he's going to do because he said no rain. There's no rain for three years. They're on Mount Carmel. And the, the, the phrase, how long will you halt between two opinions? It's like you're, you're hobbling between these two choices, God or Baal. Or one commentary said it's like a bird that hops from branch to branch and can't ever make up its mind where it's going to settle. You know, the Bible said that a double-minded person is unstable in all of their ways. And I felt in this second service that I need to bear down on this just a little bit. That if you're kind of stuck in the middle, you need to make up your mind. This is showdown time in world history and in the kingdom of God. If you want to live for God on Sunday, but serve Baal on Monday, you need to repent and turn to God with all of your heart. Because there's a great showdown coming for planet Earth. Elijah says, I'm the only prophet of God. There's 450 prophets of Baal. So here's what we're going to do. You get a bowl, offer it to your God, and you call upon the name of your God, and I'll call upon the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the God that answers by fire, he'll be the true God. That's what we're going to do. And they said, it is well spoken. You got a deal. And Elijah says, all right, you guys go first. So they get a bull, they sacrifice it, put it on the altar, prepare it. But Elijah says, don't, don't set it on fire. Your God is God to set it on fire. The God who answers by fire, he's God. And the Bible says that, that they called on the name of Baal, 
from early in the morning till noontime, and they were shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. There's no reply of any kind. They danced. They hobbled around the altar that they had made. And about noon, Elijah was really enjoying this. So he started making fun of them, mocking them. Elijah said, you can read these words this way in the New Living Translation. He said, you'll have to shout louder. Maybe if he's a God, maybe he's daydreaming. Pardon me for saying this, but Elijah did. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's away on a trip. Maybe he's asleep. Somebody needs to wake him up. Elijah's having a lot of fun with the Baal worshipers. And so they didn't give up. They shouted louder, following all their normal custom. They cut themselves with knives and swords and blood is gushing out of them all around the altar. And, and they raved, the Bible said, all afternoon till the time of the evening, evening sacrifice. But there was no sound, no reply, no response from all. And then Elijah said, okay, it's my turn. He called all the people and said, come over here. They crowded around Elijah. He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been broken down. That's what happens when people walk away from God. An altar is broken down and is not used to, as a sacrifice to the Lord. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he set them up and rebuilt the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons of water. He piled wood on the altar. He sacrificed the bull, cut that animal in pieces, laid him on the wood. And then he said, I want you to fill four large jars of water. There wasn't a lot of water. They've had three years of famine. And I want you to pour it all over the wood and all over the altar. They did it. And he said, do it again. And they did it a second time. And Elijah said, do it again a third time, and they did as they said. And the Bible said the water ran around the altar and it filled the trench. He soaked that altar really good. As I was preaching this this morning, I remember a time in my life when I thought people were making it harder than it should be. It was like August of 1995. And, and I said these words, well, if it's the will of God, let's pour water on the wood and see if it's God or not. I think it was God. I was elected pastor when there was a lot of water on the altar. Anyway, so then at the usual time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed this prayer. Oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. In other words, I'm not just randomly picking something to say. I'm doing what you told me to do. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, oh, Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. If you count the words in the prayer of Elijah, there are 57 words. He doesn't spend all morning at the afternoon when you walk with God. You don't have to pray in that moment all day long and half the night. You may pray like that another time. 57 word prayer in the King James and even in this translation. And immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven. It burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones. The dust, it even licked up all the water that was in the trench. And after the fire of God fell, there was nothing there. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Amen. What an amazing miracle from the Lord. 
And then Elijah said, I want you to seize those prophets of Baal. Don't let one of those false prophets escape. He took them all down by the valley and he killed all of them there. Also some other prophets, 450 plus 400. And then in 1 Kings 1841, Elijah said unto Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, I don't think Ahab heard it or anyone else heard it, but the man of God heard something, I believe, by this story in the spirit world that had not yet been revealed in the natural world. It's kind of like count the stars. Nothing has changed, but God has spoken. And Elijah has faith that something is getting ready to change in the natural. I just want to remind you that the spiritual realm is superior to the natural realm and it controls what is in the natural. And when God speaks in the spiritual, it will change the natural world. There is something that is getting ready to be released, amen, that Elijah hears a sound of the abundance of rain. He prophesies, but then he prays. Ahab go. He goes back to the top of Mount Carmel. He falls down on the ground. His face is between his knees, and he begins to pray. Prophecy and prayer working together. He tells his servant, go look toward the sea and tell me what you see on the sea. And the servant goes and looks and he comes back and taps Elijah and says, there is nothing. That's always nice to hear, right? There is nothing. Elijah said, go again. The servant goes again and comes back and says, there is nothing. And Elijah says, go again. He goes again. And the Bible says that this happened seven times. And after the seventh time, the servant comes back to Elijah and said, this time I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And then Elijah got real excited and he shouted, hurry, go to Ahab and tell him, Climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain is going to stop you. And the Bible says that suddenly the sky was black with clouds and a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm and Ahab ran quickly to Jezreel and the rain returned to Israel. Amen. God sent drought and God sent rain. He can and he does. It is one thing to pray for rain because you're in a drought. It is altogether another thing to prophesy that it will rain because either it does or it doesn't and you will know, which takes me to Ezekiel 34. In Ezekiel 34, the Lord is speaking of a day when the Messiah will be the shepherd of Israel. This is the Old Testament. So we don't know his name, Jesus Christ. So he's referred to as my servant, David. And the Lord is saying that after a period of exile and judgment, I promise that I will bring restoration and blessing. He said, I will be their God. My servant David will be a prince among them and I will make a covenant of peace with them and I will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and they will sleep in the woods. There will be divine protection. And then in verse 26, the Lord said, and I will, I will make them and the places round about my hill, a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. The shower is going to come down 
in his season, it will bring blessing. When I was a kid, we used to sing a song by this title. Can I get a witness to anybody that ever sang showers of blessing? Would you hold up your hand? I just want everybody under 90 to see these hands right now. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops like sprinkling around us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There's five stanzas to this song. But I remember as a boy singing about showers of blessing. But Ezekiel is prophesying about what God said that he would do. The Lord said, I will. I will make this place a blessing. I will cause the shower to come down. There shall be showers of blessing. Every student of the Bible has their biblical radar going off right now. Because we understand the difference between God saying, if you will, I will. And when God says, I will. When God says, if you will, I will. It is a conditional promise. Meaning that God is waiting on you to act first. And when you do what God tells you to do, then God will respond to your obedience. But in Ezekiel 34, 26, God is assuming that the conditions have been met. And God gives an unconditional promise that I will, I will do what I said I will do. I will call showers to come down and there shall be showers of blessing. Ezekiel 34, 26 is not a call to action. It is a divine proclamation. The Lord said, I will cause the shower to come down. There shall be showers of blessing. So today I have come in the name of the Lord to do something rare in pastoral ministry. I have not come to call you to repentance. I believe that most of us have already done that. I have come to declare in the Holy Ghost that there shall be showers of blessing. If you feel like you've been in a season of drought, there shall be showers of blessing. To churches that have been in a season of drought, there shall be showers of blessing. I've come with the word of encouragement and hope and declaration that God is calling us to believe that we prayed, we fasted, we believed, we've been faithful, and there shall be showers of blessing. I want you to thank the Lord for it right now and believe for the Lord right now. If you're backslidden, turn to the Lord. If you're not serving God, serve the Lord. But to the vast majority, I preach, you've been sowing. You've been waiting. We've been praying for the rain. But God has said, it is time for there to be showers of blessing. In our culture, God is giving the altar call. God is ready for there to be an outpouring of his spirit in this latter day. Like Elijah, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Get ready for it. Prepare for it. Believe for it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. You can begin making your way to the altar. Showers of blessing. 
that bring healing to unproductive ground that will produce again. You've been sowing, you've been working, you've been praying, but you feel like nothing has happened, but there shall be showers of blessing. Showers of blessing that bring financial provision and miracles. Showers of blessing that bring revival to the church. Showers of blessing that bring resurrection power to sinners. What I feel in my soul is a declaration of what will be by the word of the Lord. Go ahead, Ahab. Get moving. Let the rain stop you not. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Let the Lord strengthen you, encourage you. Worship the Lord in the spirit right now. That's not let the Holy Ghost. There shall be showers of blessing. <laughs> 